back one up. What? about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground when i think about the lord how he saved me how he raised me how he filled me with the holy ghost how he healed me to the uttermost when i think about the lord how he picked me up he turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. It makes me want to shout. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me, to the uttermost when I think about the Lord how he picked me up he turned me around how he placed my feet on solid ground it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you Jesus Lord you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise Woo! Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. It makes me want to shout. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. It makes me want to shout. Amen. Amen. All right. Anybody have prayer requests tonight? Miss June, husband, Mr. Tony, just remember him.
Has he recovered from his surgery? All right. Anyone else? Mr. Jerry, how you doing? Yes, sir. Keep praying for you. All right. Miss Gail. Okay. Bubba Strickland. Okay, Boo. Briggs. Okay. Anybody else? Pray request. Tony. Thank you so much for Sunday, everybody. All you did, it was very successful. John Bullet. Okay. Jonah, okay. Yeah, we miss him, Bubba. All right. Anybody else? Let's pray for our church family. Again, thank you for uh, all that everyone did Sunday. It was a very, very, very good service. The meal, Tony, everyone who was participating and helped out, thank all y'all. It was great, uh, more than enough, and uh, we had a very blessed day, a very blessed day. Okay, all right, good. Okay, uh, Solomon. No notes sent home. Okay. I know how you feel, son. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. If you stand, if you can, if you can't, be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the request. We thank you, Lord, that you're able to take care of all our requests. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us uh, the importance of prayer, bringing our needs, petitions before you, Lord. And we bring them, God, with faith and confidence, uh, God, that you can do all things. And, Lord, you never fail us. And, God, you're always on time. You're never late. And everything you do is good and perfect. And we thank you for it, Lord. And our loved ones and friends and the needs, Lord, that we've mentioned, God, we pray you work on their behalf physically and spiritually. And take care of all the needs, God, that, Lord, you know about. But we want to bring them to you, Lord, and remind you uh, again and again, Lord. We're going to keep bringing them to you. And we thank you, Lord, that you're going to do what we can't do. And we bless you in advance already uh, for what you are doing, Lord. Thank you again for a good celebration last Sunday. Thank you for the food, the fellowship, the service, everything, the music, everything, Lord. We just praise you. Most of all, for you being here and blessing us, and we're thankful we could be here tonight, Lord. And as we have this study, we pray you would speak to our hearts, and we just pray you would be glorified in this service tonight. Pray for all of our church family. Pray for our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The children can go next door. Thank you all so much for taking care of the kids. Um, you did an excellent job. Last week, uh, we started anyway, there were just a few people here, but we started our study last week in 2 Timothy chapter, two, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, we talked about um, a faithful finish. Uh, a lot of people get started uh, in the walk with the Lord, but uh, it's important that we finish well. And we talked about last week, and we won't talk about it again tonight, we can move on to our second study. We talked about passing the torch and um, the legacy, moving on, how that uh, Timothy's aunt and grandmother, how they influenced his life. Paul wanted to pass on his uh, lineage and his uh, testimony, his work uh, to young Timothy, uh, and he did it with a purpose. 
and we talked about the parental affection, how that we are to treat uh, our kids and the families and people around us. We should encourage them, not uh, try to beat them down. We should pray for them, and that God's going to use them. And we should always praise the Lord. It's a wonderful part of passing on the torch. Uh, tonight is a very important study. We're going to look together in 2 Timothy 1, verse 6 through 10. Uh, we're talking about rekindling your spiritual flame. Uh, it would be a wonderful thing uh, if people would not lose their excitement uh, about the Lord. We get excited about everything else. We get concerned, motivated by everything else. Uh, I believe you're excited about the Lord or you wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, but we're here tonight to talk about rekindling the spiritual flame. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Paul's writing this letter to Timothy, young minister of the church in Ephesus. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Be thou therefore not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Verse 10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, has brought life and immortality, immortality to light through the gospel. So we look together tonight in these few verses. We're talking about rekindling the spiritual flame. Now what you do uh, with your spiritual gift is important. But we're going to talk about what to do when your spiritual fire and the flicker of your excitement or your gift is about to go out. Paul is telling us in this passage uh, that we learn from these verses uh, when we're in a spiritual journey, we want to finish well. We've got to continually to rekindle the spiritual flame. And we're going to look together tonight at a few things that can help us do that. Now, as we talk about our study tonight, I want you to think about uh, what is your spiritual gift. What is it that you like to do? What is it you just do? Uh, you don't even know you're doing it. Uh, you, you exercise your faith in it. You're doing it. It's just like people who are leaders. You don't call them to be a leader, and they become a leader. You call them to be a leader because they're already leading. And so that's just like somebody called in the ministry. Uh, they've been called by God, and then you recognize the call, and they move into the ministry. So remember that we all have spiritual gifts. Uh, verse 6, we all need regular spiritual rekindling, as Paul writes, wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that I stir up the gift of God. The word wherefore refers to Timothy's unfeigned faith. When God saves us, he gives us a spiritual gift, uh, his seed from the, uh, to equip us for the purpose in which God called us. This may mean transforming talents into spiritual gifts. The word uh, translated stir up is a present tense. And uh, it means to stir and to refuel, so, so do we, we got to stir it up. It means to continually rekindling. That's what we have to do. We have to continually stir up the gift that God's given us. Yes, so the fire needs constantly stirring and refueling. So do we, if our spiritual gifts are to uh, flame with continuous vigor and power, whatever it is that God called you to do. Now, People like, for instance, Tony, Lucille, others who work in the kitchen, Miss Carol and others, and Brother Jerry, and all other people who do, uh, that's a, what you call a gift of hospitality, that you are taking care of people, their needs, you welcome them, you feed them, you take care of them, that's just a gift you have. Some people have a gift of teaching, some people have gifts of preaching, some people have gifts of pastoring. Uh, some people have evangelistic gifts. Some people have gifts of, of, uh, of, of love and encouragement. Uh, people just have gifts of prayer. Uh, I've, I've known people in my life before who 
That's all they do is pray continuously. They intercede for people. So whatever your gift is, gift of encouragement, it's always a wonderful thing to have somebody around you to encourage you. Amen? A lot of people uh, don't have much to say, but to be encouraged is a wonderful gift. Paul encourages Timothy to stir up the gift which is in thee. The Greek word uh, gift here refers to spiritual gifts received from the Holy Spirit that equips us for God's purpose. Now, every Christian has at least one spiritual gift. We all need to know that. 1 Corinthians 7 and 7 says, But every man uh, has his proper gift, his own gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Whatever your gift may be. Nobody, you know, you may have the same kind of gift somebody else has, but everybody don't have the same gift. And so God gives you that gift, and we need to keep it stirred up. We need to keep on doing it. People who fall out of church, quit on God, uh, all they do is put void the gift that God's given them. To fulfill God's purpose for our life, we must discover and develop and use our spiritual gifts. Find out what it is. Seek the Lord. Uh, see what you're doing. See what you like to do. Uh, this is what meant, is meant here when it says to stir up the gift of God. Then how uh, we use our gifts. The Bible said in 1 Peter 4.10, if every man has received the gift of grace, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God didn't give you that gift just so you could enjoy it. God has given us these gifts that we can minister one to another. That's the uniqueness of a church. Uh, everybody is a different function because they have a different gift. Uh, it would be terrible in here Sunday if the preacher tried to sing. That just ain't my gift. If it was, you would never get home on Sunday. But um, you've got to do what God's called you to do and keep it stirred up. Uh, don't let anything, anybody, any circumstance, any problem uh, rob you from continually stirring up that gift, whatever it is, gift of leadership, whatever it is, you've got to keep stirring it up, keep doing it. So God's given us a spiritual gift to use that we can minister one to another. And when we forget this, our spiritual flames, they begin to flicker. And after a while, if you're not careful, uh, it'll just go out. Therefore, Paul reminds Timothy of his spiritual gift, which he received by the putting on, he said, of my hands. Uh, this could refer to Timothy's ordination or to the time of his conversion uh, which is when we receive our spiritual gifts. So to kindle our spiritual gifts, we not only remember our spiritual gifts, but not just to remember it, but we got to rekindle it. Paul continues um, uh, with a, one of my favorite verses where it says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Well, this scripture surely uh, should have been said and has been said a lot in the past three years because you know, our, our, our nation continuously and even church people walk around in fear. God don't give you fear. That didn't come from God. God gives us a gift uh, of spirit, of f not fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So we sometimes get uh, uh, tired and lose our enthusiasm for serving the Lord because uh, we face opposition. Don't be surprised uh, when you have opposition. It's a good sign when everybody don't go along with you, when everybody don't agree, when you know what you're doing is right. Uh, the world's not going to agree with you. Don't expect un unsaved people to agree with you. So there will be opposition. Sometimes we feel intimidated or helpless, which Paul calls the spirit of fear, of fear. The evil one's most effective weapon is quenching our spiritual flame by giving us fear. A wonderful acrostic for the fear of the devil plans in our heart is false evidence appearing real. That's what he does. He brings false evidence. A actually, uh, the Bible teaches us that uh, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He will accuse you. He would mock you. He would um, do things that cause you to have fear. We fear... Um, 
uh, we have lost our ability to use our spiritual gift. It's a lack of spiritual self-confidence. You know, uh, whatever your gift is, you need to be using it. Don't let anyone take it from you, and especially not your own self. Whatever it is, if you're a teacher, if you take care of kids, some people have a gift of taking care of the nursery. They love to be with kids. Some people like to minister to the youth. Some people like to sing. Some, Some people, people like, like to open, open the, the back, back door. door. Like I love to open the back door back there and let people in. Some people like to do different things. Don't let anybody rob you from your spiritual gifts. In the parable of the talents, a man is going on a long journey and trusts his property to three servants. We know the, uh, the, uh, the parable. The one is given five talents, the other given two talents, and the other one is given only one. After a long time, the master returns uh, for an accounting. The first two have doubled their talents. The third man has buried his one talent in the ground. So what does he tell him the master's reason for hiding the talent? He said, I was afraid, and I went, and I hid thy talent in the earth. Think about all the talents, all the talents that have gone to waste that could have been used by God to send a cemetery. Think about it. All the people that, who could have served the Lord while they were living, they were saved people and did nothing. You know, there should be everybody who's saved ought to be doing something in the church for the glory of God. Somebody... Get a deep breath and say amen. Don't go hide your talent by saying, I just don't feel like it. If God's given you a gift, you ought to be doing it. A spirit of fear will cause you to bury, uh, cause us to bury our spiritual gift. A spirit of fearfulness is seen in the Israelites when they finally come to the border of the promised land. Remember in Numbers 13, 33, they sent out 12 spies to bring back the report. The Bible says, and they came back, and there were saw, they saw giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we uh, were of our own self as grasshoppers. Uh, they were fearful. Well, God told them to go, but they were fearful. They forgot about who God was. When we get a grasshopper mentality, uh, we have the spirit of fear, which is the result of forgetting the resources God has given us to use our spiritual gifts effectually. Whatever it is, use your gift. When you use that gift, you defeat the devil. When we get the grasshopper feeling, we must remember God has given us three great resources. The first resource is the spirit of power. God gives us power. It's not our power, but it's God's power. The word translated power in the Greek word, which we know when we get from the English word, is dynamite. God gives us more power than the devil has. Now, by yourself, you can't defeat the devil, but with God and his power, it's like dynamite. You can blow him up. You can just get rid of him. It refers to a great force of energy. God infuses us with his power so we can effectually use our spiritual gifts and fulfill his purpose for our life. That's why God gives us that spiritual gift. Why he gives us that power. Not just so we can say, you know, I'm saved and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Sit there doing nothing but going rotten. God wants you to work that gift. He wants you to use your spiritual gifts. Amen. So we see in Ephesians 3.20. It says, now unto him, listen very carefully, who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according, listen now to the last part, according to the power that worketh in us. God's power in us. We've got to remember, you know, God saves you. It's God saving you. He didn't, we don't save ourselves. God gives you a spiritual gift, and it's like he gives you an automobile, and then he gives you the gas to go in it so you have power to do what you're supposed to do. God gives us power. The second resource is the spirit. Uh, the word translated love um, uh, is a supernatural love that is not emotional or conditional. It's the spirit of love. Agape means to love regardless of who they are or how they act. You're supposed to love everybody. 
So uh, accompanying the power to do what God has put on us on earth to do is uh, a supernatural ability to love those among whom we must minister believers and non-believers alike. You have to uh, ask God to help you to love people. Anybody ever had an occasion where you had a hard time loving somebody? Well, you've got to ask God to help you love them because you can't without the power of God. Nothing reveals our spiritual flames or flickering uh, like a lack of love. You've got to love people. When we have a hard time loving difficult people at church or work or our family, we need to fan the, uh, the spiritual flames. When our spiritual flames are, are, are fully ignited, we can obey the commandment God gives us in 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Let all your things, all your works be done with charity or love, whatever you do, whatever you do. I know sometimes it's difficulty in ministry. So what do you mean, preacher? Whatever it is that God has called you to do, sometimes you have difficulties. It's because you're ministering to people. And how many know you can have difficult experiences with other people? But you've got to ask God to help you find a way to love them. Do what's right. Amen? So you got to love everybody. You can love people when you ask God to help you by His power. So we got to rekindle that spiritual flame. we got to remember we have spiritual gifts and recognize that the resources that God gives us, power, the spirit of love, God gives us a sound mind. Amen? A sound mind. It means self-control or to be cool-headed. To be cool-headed. Uh, when you like a, a, a when you when you uh, act like a hothead, you don't have a sound mind. God's Holy Spirit gives us the power to control our passions and our reactions. We can't be hot-headed. I tell you, sometimes it's hard, but you got to keep yourself cool by the help of God, by His power, His love, and maintain sound mind. They're available to us because the Holy Spirit lives in us. We, we don't have no excuse not to do what the Bible tells us to do. We have been given these resources. Thirdly, we've got to always rely on God's power. Now, the resource God supplies enables us to be faithful to finish. Therefore, Paul writes, Be thou therefore ashamed, not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. He's writing to Timothy. So Timothy uh, may have been struggling with fear or being arrested and executed. Remember, Paul was uh, in pending execution, planted fear in the hearts of all the believers, which was Nero's intent. Can you imagine uh, the people you're serving the Lord with? Some, one of them just got beheaded yesterday, and they're looking at you. Uh, Paul says to Timothy, don't be ashamed. Of the Lord. In other words, don't reject the Lord. Don't uh, refuse to stand up for the Lord. I wish I could remember the name of the young lady some years back when someone went into a school with a shooting and put the gun right in her face and asked her, Was she a Christian? She said, Yes, I am. It was not ashamed of the Lord. And then he proceeded to shoot her. We're in a, an intimidated situation. We should not be ashamed of the testimony. Of the Lord. Have you ever been in a situation uh, where fear causes you to hope no one would find out that you're a Christian? Ever been like that? I hope not. Have you ever been afraid to speak up about what is right? Speak about what is right. Have you ever been ashamed to speak up about biblical morality? It is part of being ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Sometimes the only alternative of being ashamed is to suffer hardship for the gospel. Jesus died. All he wants us to do is live for him. Sometimes the only alternative is not to be ashamed, but to suffer hardship for the gospel. When tempted to be ashamed of our Lord, we need to remember what words Jesus says to us in Luke 9, 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me, in my word, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. So if we are going to be ashamed of the Lord now, Will he be ashamed of us then? So we're not to be ashamed of Christ, and we're not to be ashamed of other Christians. And Paul writes, says, nor 
Don't be ashamed of Christ, nor of me, his prisoner. Paul was a prisoner for the Lord. So there are times when we are tempted to be ashamed of a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe it has to do with boldness uh, in expressing their faith or their unwillingness to compromise their convictions. Have you ever been in a crowd or something going on and someone said, that ain't right? Now, who did you stand with? You've got to stand up for, with the Christian. Don't be ashamed of what's right. We may not agree with the method of conviction, but we must cherish their commitment to the Lord and the fact that we are part of the same spiritual family. The people who stands up boldly. Have you ever been around somebody who was uh, trying to win somebody to the Lord? I hope you didn't go hide your head somewhere in the corner. You ought to be praying for them. You ought to be praying for them. I remember going out witnessing with a friend of mine one night, visitation, and I said to Brother James, Now, James, I'm going to be over here witnessing to this man, and I want you to be praying while I'm witnessing. Well, I didn't want him to go over and bow his head and close his eyes. I just wanted him to sit there and pray. I looked across the room. He was over there just to pray. Amen. He won't be ashamed to pray. But you ain't got to bow your head and close your eyes. You can be praying uh, to the Lord. Paul continues, Be thou a partaker of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. Now, suffering, ridicule, persecution in any form is not something we must endure uh, in our own power, but by the power of God. God gives us power. This kind of enduring power is not available until we need it. God has power there when we need it. He knows when we need it. So Jesus told his disciples not to worry about what to say or how to say it when they were arrested. Then he tells them in Matthew 10, 19, and 20, For it shall be given to you in the same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye yet speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Have you ever wanted to go talk to somebody? Uh, have you ever wanted to go and minister to somebody? And I hope before you got there, you may say, you know, I just don't know what to say. The Lord tells us, don't you worry about what to say. You make yourself available to go, and when you go, God will give you the words to say. It will overwhelm you, uh, the words God will uh, put in your heart, and, and you speak through your mouth. Sometimes uh, we have to preach. And sometimes you get a little, you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I, I've preached summers before. I knew it was going to uh, kind of disturb somebody uh, and disturb things in the church when things weren't right. But you can't have fear. You've got to go ahead and preach the gospel. You can't compromise the word of God just because you have fear. You can't be fearful of what you're going to preach. So we've got to make sure that we continue in the power of God. We do it because it's the word of God, but we do it with the spirit of love. Sometimes we forget God's power is made perfect or complete in our weakness. We can endure any affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. This is because of the truth found in Philippians 4.13. We know that scripture. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So when you're about to witness you're about to minister to somebody. Uh, you're doing and exercising your spiritual gift. Just remember, uh, God's going to give you the strength that you need. He's going to give you the strength of the Lord Jesus. When we are suffering for the gospel, we will receive supernatural strength according to the power of God. Have you ever just stopped for a little while, church, and thought about what I just said? The power of God. That when we do what God's called us to do, we're not doing it in the exercise of our power, but in the power of God. Now, is anyone, anything, any greater than the power of God? Nothing. Nothing. Only the power of God that can raise the dead. He can change the whole situation. So always remember that we do what we do in the power of God. Do you know why most Christians never really exercise the power of God in their lives? They're never in the midst of circumstances where they need it. So they just go with the flow. Uh, when you endure suffering in whatever form we call of the gospel, you will exercise or experience God's supernatural power in your life. 
However, this power is reserved for those who are not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. I wonder today why so many people are not witnesses. Why we don't witness every day. We have occasion every day that we draw breath to witness to somebody. We got a t- people there in our life. So don't be fearful. Don't be fearful. Ask God to help you to be a witness and to share your faith. Fourthly, today, receive or review our salvation. When our spiritual flames begin to flicker, we need to remember who has saved us and called us, the Bible says, with a holy calling. Now, why did God save you and save me? Have you ever thought about that? Why did he save you? He saved us so we would live a holy life before a sinful world. We are to let our light shine. We are saved not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. God saved us for a purpose. And the truth of the matter is, uh, every day we all go in different directions. And so we all see different people. Uh, And also, you know people that other people don't know. So everywhere we go, we are to be a witness for the Lord Jesus. God saved us for that reason. He gave you that gift for that reason. God saved us because of his own purpose or plan for your life. God didn't save you just to go to heaven. There's a purpose and a reason why. The reason for our salvation is God's purpose for our life, and the means of our salvation is God's grace. He saved us because of his grace. Grace means uh, we don't deserve it, but God saved us anyway. Anyway, we don't deserve salvation. The grace was given us in Christ before the world even began. In other words, Christ existed before the beginning of time, and the grace that saves us pre-existed in Him. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 1, 4, According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. God says we live a holy life, and that's not a capital H, it's a small H, but God's holy, but we are to do everything we can to live a clean, God-respectful life. This means your salvation and mine was in the mind of God in eternity past, long before we even existed. If that doesn't fan your spiritual flame, I don't know what will. God had you and me on his mind before the world even began. Aren't you glad? Say amen. Before time began... God had made provision for your salvation, my salvation, and it's it's now made manifest to us by the appearing of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has abolished death. The word translated abolished means to render inoperative. Death has no victory over us. Isn't it wonderful to sit here tonight and know that death don't have any victory over you? Isn't it good to know that you have someone, a loved one, a friend who belongs to the Lord and no matter what's happening in their life, death has no victory over that loved one. The Bible teaches us when Jesus died on the cross, he took the sting out of death. It's not no longer our enemy. Uh, Death is our friend because death for us is not the end of life but the beginning of eternal life. My gracious. Jesus also brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, the word of God. You know, do we understand the importance, the necessity, the great need of the word of God? Preached, shared, taught, read, studied, sought the word of God. The gospel is the power. It's in the word of God that brings us salvation. Jesus also brought life and immortality to light through the word. Eternal life and mortality was obscure and hidden in darkness, but Jesus brought eternal life to light so we could see it and understand how to receive it. The Bible says in John 1, 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus is the word of God. He's the light of the world. 
The word light refers to a spiritual understanding. The life and words of Jesus, which contain the gospel, penetrate our hearts, our mind, bringing spiritual enlightenment, understanding about the way of eternal life. There's no other way. There's no other way whatsoever anybody can ever come to knowledge of salvation, understanding, conviction of salvation apart from the gospel. You can talk to people about a lot of things. And there's a lot of people involved in a lot of things, organizations, clubs, whatever, and to think the creeds and the sayings and the motions and the things and the exercises they do is enough to save them. Ain't nothing going to save you but the Word of God. That's the only thing that can save mankind, sinful mankind, wash away all of our sins, make us look as white as snow in the Lord Jesus, the only thing that ever works is the gospel and God's given it to us and we have the power of God living us and we need to we need to fill our heart our minds and our souls with the word of God so that God can use us uh, to lead people to the Lord the word light here refers to spiritual understanding spiritual understanding you know you can share your testimony about being saved and what God's done for you or what you used to be and how God changed your life and how you got saved. And I, I've talked that way many times and uh, witnessing the people. And when I do that and it don't seem to affect them too much about what I tell them the Lord has done in my life, I began to use the gospel because the word of God is what enlightens them. It's what wakes up their understanding. The word of God is amazing. Amen. Because Jesus is the living word. And when you read the word and share the word, you share in Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation to the end, the beginning, the middle, everywhere there's a scarlet thread of blood running completely through every word in the Bible. And when you share that word, the word of God, you share in Jesus. Amen. You share in Jesus. So if you're witnessing somebody and they just don't seem to get it, you share the word. Share the word of God, and they're either going to receive it or they're going to quench the spirit of God, and they're going to reject the Lord. There ain't nothing you can do about that but trust the word of God. The life and the words of Jesus, which contain the gospel, penetrate our hearts and minds, bringing spiritual understanding, enlightenment about the way to eternal life. It's the only way anybody can ever come to true salvation is by the word of God. You know, we need to remember, ain't got nothing to do with this preacher here, ain't got nothing to do with you. We got to remember that we are privileged to be in a church where the Word of God is taught, the Word of God is preached, the Word of God is believed, and the Word of God is exercised. Would you say amen? Trust the Word of God. All we need is the gospel to be what God wants us to be. So, think for just a moment. What is it? What is it in your own life that you may need to stir up tonight to rekindle that fire that we can be what God wants us to be? Now, I had no problem whatsoever selecting uh, the thing in my life that I need to constantly stir up uh, to be reminded what God has called me to do. I know what my spiritual gift is. I know what it is. And if the devil can keep me from doing that, well, he's already whipped me. He's already whipped me. But my spiritual gift uh, is witnessing, soul winning. The Lord came to me in a vision and gave me a dream and told me I was to be an outreacher. And if the devil can keep me from reaching out, then he's got me. He's got me. Okay? That's my gift. So what is your gift? What is it your gift? Remember your spiritual gift. Recognize your resource. Rely on God's power and review your situation of salvation with the Lord. You've got to think about what is your gift. What does the Lord, what do you do? What is it that God has put in your life? You just can't help but do it. And you do it. And you do it. That's what gets me about people who are spiritually gifted. And they're not even having any concern whatsoever about exercising their spiritual gift. In just a moment, I'm going to walk down them steps. And that ankle and that foot and that leg 
is going to do what God made it to be, a part of this body. So I can walk down there, okay? Whatever it is, you are part of the body of Christ. The only place you can't control is the head, because Jesus is the head of the church, amen? But we, his body, and whatever it is you're supposed to be doing, make sure you get busy and you do it. You ought to run over to preacher. Preacher, I want to do this. Preacher, I want to do that. Preacher, I want to do that. Whatever your gift is, don't let the devil steal it. So tonight, maybe you need to stir up your spiritual gift. Rekindle that fire. What is it? Keep doing it. Keep doing it no matter what happens. The devil may knock you down. Get up. Keep doing it. He may get a lick on you. He may knock you flat on your back. Get up. Keep doing it. The Bible said a spiritual man I get knocked down seven times before you get back up. Amen. A saved person. We all get knocked down sometime. We all forget what we should be doing. We get sidetracked. We get comfortable. And before long, before you know it, whatever it is in that part of the body, it's not functioning like it's supposed to. Whatever God has called you to do, you ought to be doing it. Would you say amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your word. God, our desire above all things is to please you. And God, you've called us. You've saved us. You've given us the power to serve. And I pray, dear Lord God, we are not quit and be quitters. We endure to the end. We don't just endure because we're saved, but it is because we say that we endure doing what you've called us to do, whatever it is. Not let us, Lord, to look around and point to somebody else to do what we're supposed to be doing. And most of the time when we do that, we're just telling on ourselves. So, Lord, help us to do what you've called us to do until we hear the shout or until we stand before you, Lord. Help us to keep on doing and exercising that God-given spiritual gift from above. In God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a safe night, and I'll see you Sunday morning for Sunday school. God bless you.